The Pest and Predator podcast is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. Welcome to the Pest and Predator podcast brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. I'm your host, Sean Haney, founder of realagriculture.com. Today's guest on the Pest and Predator podcast is Jeremy Irvin. He's a master's student at the University of Saskatchewan. Jeremy, welcome to the Pest and Predator podcast. Nice to be here. Okay, so you're you're a graduate student at the University of Saskatchewan. Talk about some of your research that you've been doing, where your focus, what what it's been on. So I'm looking at the economic entomology of uh, red clover seed production systems. Um, so I am more most worried about this insect pest, the lesser clover leaf weevil, and it's a pest of red clover, but mostly it um, it affects seed yield the most. So. Uh, what I'm trying to determine is the economic threshold of when we can, when is the best time to control this insect pest. Okay. And I, I guess let, let's learn a little bit more about this pest. What does the lesser clover leaf weevil look like? So the adults look pretty much like any other weevils that you might find in agricultural fields. Um, pea weevils are pretty common from a lot of agricultural producers. So they have uh, six legs and that makes them insects. But their most defining characteristic is the presence of a rostrum. So this is an elongated snout-like projection off the front of their face. Overall, the adults are kind of, they're quite small, between about four and six millimeters in length. And their coloration kind of depends on the time of the year. But in early spring, which is when they're most problematic, they kind of have uh, kind of a blue-green coloration. Um, the issue, but the larvae of these beetles are kind of a small grub or worm-like insect. And that's what's actually causing the yield loss. So they're kind of like very small cutworms in general morphology, but the larval size and color also depends on the, um, are very dependent on their age. So these larvae go through four separate instars, and each one of these is uh, larger than the last. So what we found in the field is the first and second instars are kind of between two and four millimeters in length, and the last two are kind of between four and nine millimeters in length. They're generally um, kind of a light green or almost clear color, and they kind of darken with each, with each subsequent instar. Okay, so what areas of the country are they prevalent in, and, and which crops are they trying to, to feed on the most? So they are a pest of most of the clovers, but like I mentioned, with, um, with how we feed, they're mostly um, most detrimental to seed yields. They're not as much a, a forage crop pest. So their host range is generally wherever red clover is grown. Um, so... That's kind of northeastern Saskatchewan, um, that's, as well as that kind of the peace region of uh, Alberta, BC. But um, they're kind of only a pest wherever the seed is grown. So there is a lot of red clover seed grown, or a lot of red clover grown in other uh, portions of the country. But where the seed is grown is where they're actually um, most damaging. Okay. Now, you mentioned a little bit of the life cycle already. Um, let, let's review some of the, the bio, biology and the life cycle. And that... <clears throat> Like talk about those life stages and what, which of those are the most damaging <laughs> to some of the crops? Right. So the lesser cool leaf weevil life cycle is pretty consistent across most of Canada. So the insect is univoltine. So that means they only have one generation per year. So kind of for Saskatchewan and Alberta regions. So starting after the snow melts, um, the adults were actually overwintering. Um, so they'll begin to emerge from the soil surface. And from there, they'll start to mate with each other. Um, a few weeks after that, the females will begin laying eggs on red clover plants as the red clover resumes growth after the previous winter. And the eggs are usually laid in kind of small clusters in the leaf stipules or inside the stem. And after a short period, these eggs will hatch. So that's when these larvae will be emerge from the, um, the eggs and they'll begin feeding on the red clover plants. Usually the first two um, larval instars feed on the vegetative materials hidden within the stipules of the red clover plant. Yeah. And as that red clover plant grows, um, they'll gradually move up the plant with it until they run out of food. The biggest, um, the most damaging part of their life cycle is when that red clover plant switches from reproductive, um, or sorry, switches from vegetative over to reproductive growth and starts to create those flower buds. So as that plant is growing, the weevils are, or the larvae are coming up with it, and they start to eat and feed on the developing uh, flower buds and the subsequent seeds, and that's where we lose a lot of that yield. Oh, wow. Okay. And 
the the environment can always have an impact on you know the crop and and the you know and the pests that are in and outside of the canopy. So, sure. how do some of the environmental factors influence the behavior and the population of of the weevils? So yeah, climatic factors of course have a large influence on the population dynamics of these plants and along with the crops that they're in. Um, what we've kind of found is like early, sp- early warm spring temperatures can cause the adult weevils to exit their dormant period a little bit usually than or earlier than uh, usual. And that further than that warmer than average temperature will accelerate their development. So some, some experiments I conducted in the lab last year showed that an increase of five or 10 degrees accelerated larval development by 25 and 71% um, respectively. And that's compared to a constant development temperature at 15 degrees. So we know that these warming temperatures are speeding up the weevil life cycle. And um, when that correlates with um, when that plant is switching over to reproductive growth, that's why we have these really high yield issues. Okay, so let's talk about controls. How, how are they currently controlled? <clears throat> so the main control method is chemical um, insecticide materials. Usually um, in Saskatchewan here, I'm not sure what other provinces, but there's only kind of one registered insecticide material and that's delta methrin or feces. Um, unfortunately, it's only in Saskatchewan, it's only registered for suppression use. And so the label is not stating that, hey, we're gonna completely control this pest in the field. Um, and that's why a lot of producers have continual issues with this is because they're not getting really good control. Yeah. And a lot of the reason they're not getting control is due to the biology of um, the lesser clover weak leaf weevil. Um, the larvae are hiding within the leaf stipules or within the actual stem of the plant itself. And because of that, um, delta methrin is a contact insecticide. It actually has to contact that insect that we're targeting or contact the um, plant material that the insect's going to feed on. And basically, just because of the biology of this insect pest, that's just not happening. So we are spraying for them, but it's not very good. We're not getting very good control. Hmm. There are some other methods um, that producers can use. So um, you can burn fields in the fall and spring. Of course, that's not really a good idea. There's a lot of issues around burning fields, of course. Um, but that can have some amount of control. Um, but yeah, basically what um, it boils down to is the chemical option and it's not working that well. So we wanna really make sure that we're trying, um, we're applying these insecticide materials at the best times to get the best control possible. Yeah, so how do we determine that? Um, and, and what are some of the factors that go into the decision-making, like thresholds and, and things like that when we are thinking about uh, trying to use some of the, the, the potential controls that are out there? Right, and that comes back to the main focus of this research. Um, currently, producers are kind of using a normal thresh, uh, threshold, um, which many utilize, and it's generally between four to six larvae per 10 red clover shoots. However, these nominal thresholds are based a lot of on just personal intuition and some research that was done about over 30, 40 years ago. Mm. Um, and of course, the production of red clover and its market price has changed quite a bit since this period. And that indicates that we need to then change how we are making these spray decisions. Um, like I mentioned, uh, delta methrin is only registered for suppression purposes rather than complete control. And um, it's actually limited to two uh, application windows per year. So if you didn't get a good control the first time, you do have a second shot at it. Um, but after that, you would be off the label. You wouldn't be uh, yeah. allowed to use that insecticide material. You missed the window. Yeah, you missed that window. Um, another big issue with um, the uh, applying insecticide materials right now is they're incredibly harmful to the populations of beneficial insects. And in this case, bees are the major ones. So, excuse me, red clover is generally considered to be pretty self-sterile, so it can't self with itself and reproduce that way. So it relies heavily on insect pollination, and that's mainly by bees. Hmm. Um, some producers will um, rely on native pollinators that are just out there in the fields, whereas either due to the... Um, Seed co- or um, seed yields and the market price of this, some producers will have managed pollinators be brought in, such as honeybees or leaf cutters. And um, of course, we want to limit da- limit damage to these little foraging bees as much as we can. So that highlights the need to only spray when necessary. Okay, so you mentioned beneficials. Are are there any beneficials that are taking care of some business here to help you out on the control side? <clears throat> So yeah, there are some beneficials that have been noted to help control um, this pest. um, So there are quite a few different species of parasitoid wasps, and they will actually lay their eggs within the lesser cloverleaf weevil. And once these eggs hatch, the the wasp eggs hatch, these newly hatched larvae will eat their way out of the weevil larvae. So that can have some amount of control. 
However, the uh, efficacy of this is highly dependent on the natural populations that are actually already present within the agro ecosystem. And um, again, that highlights the need to only uh, apply insecticide materials when they're actually warranted or else mm. we're also reducing that um, in field population. Um, and uh, we, there hasn't been any research really into how well the parasoid wasps um, control um, the lesser clover leaf weevil in nature, but uh, that's something we'd like to look at in the future. Another aspect of kind of field heroes, well, it's just kind of a step away from insects, but it are biological control methods. And there are many pathogens that can affect, infect these insects, but the frequency of this has really yet to be investigated. So it's, diff it's difficult to say if it's an effective control measure. Okay, and some I probably should have asked earlier, I, I kind of skipped over it, but scouting, what, you know, when and how should I be scouting for this pest as we try to identify in the field? Yeah, so that's another part of this research that we're looking at. Um, generally, like I said, the most damaging part of this insect uh, life cycle is when the plant is switching from um, vegetative over to reproductive growth. So that is kind of the timing of when scouting should be occurring. For red clover in Saskatchewan and many regions in Western Canada, that's kind of mid to late June. Um, so, and like I said, the part of this research is to determine the best time to do that as it depends on climatic factors. Most effective time to spray this insecto materials would be right around this period um, because that then the delta methrin, as it's a contact insecticide, it has the highest chance of actually um, suppressing the larval feeding habits because those, um, those uh, larvae actually are exposed on the plants. Yeah. Really cool stuff, Jeremy. Now, I, I, I'm curious, you know, we, we, you talked about the research you're doing, we've talked about a bunch of these issues. What got you into this specific piece of research? What, what was the trigger, the interest? Do you got a lot of clover production on the, the, the farm back home or what, what, what was the initial enabling? Um, no, it was um, something I've never really looked into before. So I uh, farm in northeastern Saskatchewan as well, kind of that Melford region, and we produce a lot of the main crops, uh, you know, um, oats, wheat, barley, canola. But if you only go in another far, uh, one hour further northeast towards that Nipwin region, um, they start to produce a lot of these uh, more minor use crops. And it's really interesting, a lot of the crops. And because they're more minor use and there's not a lot of growers growing these, there hasn't been a lot of research done in these areas. Mm -hmm. So I thought it'd be a really interesting uh, project to pick up and look into because um, it just really hasn't been looked at for quite a while. Uh, and it well, would greatly beneficial uh, benefit these producers. Yeah, absolutely. Great stuff. Uh, appreciate the, the, the interest in it. Jeremy, thanks so much for joining us here today on the Pest and Predator podcast. Of course. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Pest and Predator podcast. It's brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm.